Rigging jobs often involve many different kinds of equipment. So far, our experience includes using tools like hoists and slings for complex maneuvers and jacks and rollers for heavy loads. This unit deals with other kinds of specialized rigging equipment, cranes and scaffolds. In each case, we'll be talking about technique and safety. Cranes are lifting devices with two functions, to lift a load and to take it somewhere else. Although there are many different kinds of cranes, they can be divided into two basic groups. Cranes with bridges, including this overhead traveling crane and this gantry crane, and cranes with booms that can tilt and pivot around a central axis. Some booms are extendable as well, and many boom cranes are mobile. We'll be talking about each of these two kinds of cranes. We'll see how they're used, what the controls are, and how they're inspected for safety. In this section, we're going to be specifically dealing with bridge cranes. We'll start with overhead traveling cranes. These cranes have a bridge that travels along a set of rails. The operator's cage is usually attached to the bridge and moves along with it as the crane travels. The hoist is mounted on a trolley that rolls back and forth along the bridge. This allows the crane to operate in three directions, right and left, forward and back, and up and down. Inside the cage are the controls for each of the crane's functions. Often they're in the form of levers that can be pushed left or right from a central neutral position. This is a typical control arrangement, although it varies from crane to crane. On the right is the control for bridge travel. Pushing the lever to the right rolls the bridge to the right. Pushing to the left rolls the bridge to the left. When the control is returned to the neutral position, the bridge coasts along until it runs out of momentum. A foot brake is provided to stop the bridge when it's traveled far enough. Others brake automatically when the travel control is released. Next to the bridge travel control is the trolley lever. Pushing the control to the right sends the trolley forward. Pushing it to the left racks the trolley in your direction. Some overhead crane trolleys don't have brakes, so it takes a certain amount of practice to get a feel for just how far the trolley will coast before stopping. To the left of the trolley control are the hoist levers. Like many overhead cranes, this one has two hoists, one for the main hook and one for a smaller auxiliary hook. Pushing the lever to the right lowers the hook and pushing it to the left raises it. Although these controls are only typical examples, most overhead cranes have similar controls, although they may be in a different arrangement. Many have variable speed controls. The farther you push or pull a lever, the faster the crane moves. Braking capabilities also vary from crane to crane. Some brake automatically, while others have foot brakes, electrical brakes, or both. Gantry cranes are fairly similar. The main difference is that gantry cranes support their bridge on legs that travel on rails at ground level, while the rails for an overhead crane are on the same level as the bridge. This is one reason why overhead traveling cranes are usually found indoors, while gantry cranes are outdoor machines. Controls for many gantry cranes are located on a pendant that hangs down from the gantry. Sometimes overhead cranes are controlled the same way. The pendant has a row of buttons that control each of the crane's functions. Here's one typical control arrangement. Start and stop buttons are located at the bottom of the pendant. Before the crane will move anywhere, the start button must be pushed. Next to these buttons are the hoist controls. One button to raise the hoist and one to lower it. They have to be pushed one at a time. Contradictory signals can damage the mechanism. The next control is for the trolley. One button sends it forward, the other rolls it back. These controls are for bridge travel. As the bridge rolls, the operator has to walk along to keep control of the pendant, which moves along with the gantry. On the top of the pendant are two controls for electric brakes that stop the bridge. 
A skilled operator can use these controls to lift a load anywhere within reach of the crane and carry it as far as the rails extend. Many gantry cranes have variable speed controls. The harder you push the button, the faster the crane moves. Simple as the controls are, gantry cranes, like any other piece of powered equipment, require practice before an operator can have the kind of control that distinguishes him from an amateur. If you're going to be operating a crane where you work, you'll have plenty of opportunity to practice. Often crane operators have to be tested and certified on each crane they operate, and people who aren't certified aren't allowed to use the crane. Even if you're not going to be a crane operator yourself, a good knowledge of their capabilities and limitations will make a better all-around rigger. If you're working with a crane operator, you'll have to know just what he can and can't do, and know how to give signals properly. A little later on, we'll be talking in greater detail about operating overhead cranes. We'll see how periodic and daily inspections are performed, and learn some of the techniques that crane operators use to make their jobs safer and easier. Until then, study section one of your text and ask your instructor about any questions you have. Like all rigging equipment, overhead cranes are inspected for safety. They're inspected before every use, and periodically, at intervals of no longer than a year, cranes must be given a thorough inspection by an expert. This expert is responsible for documenting the condition of the crane in complete detail. Right now, he's listing his comments about the operating controls. He's been testing each control for bridge travel, trolley action, and hoist performance to see if they need adjustment or repairs. As he continues the inspection, he checks every part of the crane for damage. Bent or cracked parts, loose bolts or rivets, and cracked or worn sheaves and hoist drums can not only impair the performance of the crane, they can be safety hazards also. Part of his job is to inspect every bearing, shaft, gear, and roller for excessive wear or damage. While he's at it, He'll also check the motors and the entire electrical system of the hoist. A thorough inspection is the only way to know how safe the crane really is. Before he's finished, the inspector will have examined all the hoisting ropes and given each hook a special test to find flaws that may be hidden from the eye. When you operate an overhead crane or work near one, it's important to you that the crane is as safe as possible Periodic inspections are just one of the checks that cranes go through to ensure their safety. Now, we've already seen how an overhead crane operates. We've seen what the controls do and learned what kinds of jobs overhead cranes are capable of doing. What we're going to do now is see just what an operator has to do to make sure his crane operates safely and efficiently. We'll start at the beginning of a shift when the crane operator first comes on duty. His first job is to inspect the crane for safety you'll notice that the operator uses a checklist. The checklist serves two purposes. First, it helps the operator make sure he's inspected all the required points. And second, it allows the plant to keep a permanent record of the condition of the crane from day to day. With this in mind, let's watch the crane operator go to work. Here's our operator. He's been assigned to run the overhead crane up on the turbine deck where some heavy equipment is being moved prior to an overhaul. Here in the cage are a set of switches that controls power to the crane. There's a master switch for each of the crane's functions. In an emergency, the crane can be shut down by turning off either of these switches or by shutting off the main breaker on the floor. Now that power's on, he can begin the inspection with a check of the operating controls. First, he checks the action of the hoist mechanism. This lever controls the main hoist. He lowers and raises the big hook to make sure that the hoist responds to the controls promptly and accurately. When he's satisfied, he marks off the hoist control as OK. 
The next thing he has to check is the operation of the automatic limit control of the hoist. Most hoists have a special switch that cuts power to the hoist when the hook reaches the top of its safe operating range. This limit switch prevents the hoist from raising its hook so high that it could damage the drum or the cable. To test the limit switch, he raises the hook slowly until it reaches its upper limit. He can tell that the switch is working properly when the hoist refuses to raise the hook any farther, even though the control in the cage is in the hoist up position. Since this crane has two hoists, a main and an auxiliary, they must both be tested in the same fashion. He lowers the auxiliary hook and then raises it to make sure the controls operate in both directions. To check the limit switch, he slowly raises the hook to its highest position. When power cuts off, he knows the limit switch is working properly. The next control to be tested is bridge travel. The bridge should travel smoothly along its rails in both directions. Since this hoist is equipped with a foot brake for the bridge, it's the next item to be checked. When the operator releases the travel lever, the bridge coasts until the brake is applied. When he's sure that the bridge travel control and its brake operate correctly, he marks them both off on his checklist as OK. Some overhead cranes have limit switches for the bridge that are similar to those used on the hoists. When the bridge reaches its sidewards limit of travel, the switch cuts power to the bridge to keep it from banging into the bumpers at the ends of the rails. These switches are tested by running the bridge slowly to the end of the bridge rails until the limit is reached. When the bridge trips its limit switch, it won't go any farther, even if the travel control is actuated. To test the limit switch at the other end of the rails, the process is repeated in reverse. After the hoists and the bridge controls have been tested, the next item is the trolley control. The trolley should move forward and back with no sluggishness or stalling. When the trolley reaches the end of its range, its limit switch cuts power. So just like the bridge, it can't travel any farther. When each of the controls in the cage have been tested, only one more item remains on the checklist, the load brakes. This crane has two different brakes on the hoist, an electrically actuated solenoid brake and a mechanical brake attached to the reduction gearing of the hoist mechanism. Both operate automatically. The brakes are tested on the job by lifting a load just a few inches and stopping to see if the brakes take hold. That way, if they do slip, the load won't be high enough to do a lot of damage. Once the load brakes have been tested, the operator's checklist is complete. Each of the controls has been tested, the limit switches have been checked, and the brakes on the bridge and the hoist have been tested. In this case, no problems were detected. So, the crane's ready to use. If any problems were noticed, no matter how small, the operator's proper course of action would be to immediately inform a supervisor. Then, the crane couldn't be operated until repairs were made or the problem was positively identified as not affecting the safety of the job at hand. In this section, we've seen two different kinds of inspections that are given to overhead cranes, the periodic inspection and the operator's daily inspection. For cranes, written records are kept of both. The real difference between the two is that the periodic inspection is much more detailed and time-consuming. Often, cranes are inspected by a representative of the manufacturer. In the next section, 
We're going to see a typical job performed with an overhead crane and see how the operator controls the crane and the load. Until then, read section two of your text and work the exercises. Operating an overhead crane is both a physical and a mental skill. You've got to know just how the crane reacts to each of the controls and how fast it reacts. What's more, you have to be able to respond accurately to signals from the floor and know enough rigging techniques to make the job safe and efficient. We've already seen what the crane operator has to do when first going on shift. He has to inspect the crane and test each of its controls. What we're going to see now is a typical job using an overhead crane and see how a crane operator uses the controls to lift and move a load. The job will be to lift this container and lower it down a shaft to another elevation. That'll get it out of the way of some repairs that have to be made to one of the turbine generators. This container has already been pre-rigged. When it was lifted up to the turbine deck, the slings were left in place so that it could be moved again without having to rig it again. Each of the slings is passed over the load hook after making sure that they aren't kinked or twisted. As long as the contents of the box are evenly distributed, this central position should balance the load sufficiently. Once the slings are attached and the safety latch is in place, the rigger signals the crane operator to take up the slack. While the slings are tightened, the rigger and his helper make sure the slings stay in place without twisting or slipping off. The crane operator moves the hoist controls slowly and carefully. He's only taking up slack. He won't actually lift the load until both men have climbed down off the container. Now, on the rigger's signal, the crane operator raises the load off the floor. He lifts it as slowly as possible, especially at first, when the balance of the load is still not known exactly. As the container is lifted, it does tilt slightly. One end of the box must be loaded more heavily than the other. But with this load, a slight amount of tilt isn't important. It's still level enough to be controlled easily. Two tag lines are used to control the load's rotation. Each is carefully handled to keep the load from bumping into equipment or people. As the box travels, the tag lines are also used to control the load's tendency to swing as the bridge starts and stops. Since people are nearby, the operator uses his slowest travel speed. For safety reasons, only one person should give signals to a crane operator. This eliminates confusion since the operator then only has to watch one person at a time. In an emergency, however, he can take an emergency stop signal from anyone on the job. The most critical part of this job is when the container is aligned over the top of the shaft. Clearances here are tight and the box must be properly lined up to avoid striking the sides of the opening. Once the load's properly aligned, it's lowered down the shaft. A rigger on the lower elevation controls a tag line from below to steady the load as it's set down. It'll be landed gently by lowering until it's just off the floor, then set down with the smallest possible movements. This is just one example of the many types of rigging jobs that you may be doing with an overhead crane. Whether you're the crane operator or one of the riggers, a good knowledge of crane operation will make your job easier and safer. Remember the basic common sense rules. Don't lift over people or equipment. Use the hoist only for vertical raising and lowering, not for side pulls. If you're going to be operating a crane at your plant, you'll probably have to be specially certified for that crane, depending on your plant safety requirements. We've seen one typical control arrangement here, but many cranes are different, although the same basic controls are involved. 
You'll have to learn how your crane works, what its capacity is, how the brakes are controlled, and how any variable speed controls are operated. This kind of rigging, though, is more than just knowing how to run a crane. You've got to be able to plan a job, to figure weight, balance, and clearances. You'll have to be able to select the right equipment, inspect it, and rig it properly. These are all elements of safe rigging. To be good at it, you've got to know every part of the job. In a few minutes, we'll be moving on to take a close look at cranes with booms. We'll see what they can and can't do, and see how one typical control arrangement works. Until then, read through section three of your text. So far, we've been talking about overhead and gantry cranes, cranes with bridges. In this section, we're going to take a look at the capabilities and limitations of cranes with booms. Boom cranes come in all shapes and sizes. Although some are fixed in one location, many are mobile. This is a model of a boom crane that travels on crawler treads. Some of them have booms whose length and position is controlled with cables attached to winches in the body of the crane. Others are hydraulically operated. What they all have in common is a boom. The boom enables these cranes to reach over obstructions and lift or lower loads that couldn't be reached with an overhead or gantry crane. The boom can tilt up and down, and the entire crane can pivot around a central axis to swing the boom right and left. Some can extend and retract the boom. Let's look inside the cab and see how these movements are controlled on this hydraulic boom crane. Next to the steering wheel are a set of control levers. Each one controls a different function. Starting on the left, we have the swing lever. Pulling the lever down swings the boom to the left. Pushing the lever up pivots the crane to the right. To extend the boom, the crowd control and the hoist lever are operated simultaneously. This keeps some slack in the hoist cable so it doesn't snap as the boom extends. Reversing both levers pulls in the boom and raises the hoist. The lever on the right controls the elevation of the boom. Raising the lever raises the boom. Pushing the lever down lowers it. This lever controls the rear wheel steering. This feature makes the crane much easier to maneuver in tight spaces. All four wheels are steerable. Near the steering wheel are four levers that control the crane's outriggers. The outriggers add stability to the crane when making side lifts or raising especially heavy loads. If you're standing nearby, watch your feet when these pads come down. This is only one of many possible control arrangements for mobile boom cranes, but most are similar. With practice, a good operator can learn to play the controls like the keyboard of a piano. Although boom cranes and their controls vary quite a bit from model to model, they all share certain characteristics that make them very different from overhead cranes. One of the biggest differences between boom cranes and other types is stability. Since the weight of the load is concentrated at the end of the boom, the leverage that's brought into play tends to unbalance the crane, making it want to tip over. For this reason, the maximum capacity of a boom crane depends not only on the strength of the hoist, the lift rope, and the boom, but also on the radius of the boom. The boom's radius is the horizontal distance from the end of the boom to the center pin around which the entire crane rotates. It depends on both the boom's length and its elevation. The larger the radius, the less stable the crane will be. 
Since a short radius is more stable, it stands to reason that the crane will be able to lift the greatest amount of weight when its boom is tilted up and, if possible, shortened to the minimum extension. This gives the load the least amount of leverage and helps the crane keep its balance. Now, all boom cranes should be equipped with a load chart similar to this one. The chart shows the maximum safe capacity of the crane for every possible radius. This chart shows that you can lift 16 times as much weight at the shortest radius as you can when the boom is fully lowered. Many boom cranes have outriggers that add stability to the crane when lifting heavy loads. The chart shows exactly how much capacity is increased for each radius when outriggers are used. To increase capacity even more, some cranes are constructed so that extra counterweights can be added to further offset the tipping force of the load. Since boom cranes have these stability problems, not all of them are capable of traveling with a load. Many can only lift loads while they're stopped. If your crane can travel with a load, the load chart tells you just how heavy a load you can travel with and how fast you can move it. When you're moving the crane with a load attached, keep the boom in line with the direction of travel. That way you can keep an eye on the load and see where you're going at the same time. If the crane's not equipped to travel with a load, it can be moved by walking the load along. Swinging the boom through a 180 degree arc moves it twice the boom's radius. By moving the crane, you pick up the load again and repeat the process as many times as necessary. Never travel with the boom straight up and down. As the crane moves over uneven ground, the boom may bounce back over the top of the cab. And cranes just aren't built to function properly at this angle. Next, keep rotational speed low. Slewing the boom quickly makes the load swing away from the crane, increasing the load radius and possibly upsetting the crane. Last of all, watch out for power lines. You don't even have to touch a high voltage line to fry yourself. Just getting close can be an electrifying experience. Safe crane operation is a subject that requires a lot of knowledge and a lot of practice. Operating a crane like a pro can be a pretty tricky business sometimes. In a few minutes, we'll be back to see some other kinds of specialized equipment for getting loads and people up in the air. In the meantime, ask your instructor to tell you about the cranes where you work. The more you know about them, the better a rigger you'll make all around. While we've discussed rigging, we've seen a lot of different ways to lift objects with cranes, jacks, or hoists. There are many jobs, however, where you have to get yourself up in the air. You might, for example, have to work on top of a tall piece of equipment that's too high to reach from the ground. This is one type of situation where you'll use scaffolding. In this section, we're going to talk about the simplest kind of scaffolding, the portable type. We'll see that erecting scaffolding, like most other jobs, can be done either the right way or the wrong way. When it's your neck, make sure it's done the right way. This kind of scaffold's made of end pieces called bucks and tubular braces. The braces scissor out and attach to the bucks top and bottom. On this buck, the braces are slipped over studs and secured with nuts. Since the nuts themselves don't actually support any weight, screwing them on finger tight is good enough. When both the bottom and the top are secured to the first buck, they'll hold it upright while the second buck is brought into position. When building this kind of scaffold, it's important that opposing bucks and braces are the same size. 
That keeps the scaffold square and level. Braces are attached to this buck in a slightly different way. Instead of being fastened with nuts, the braces slip over the studs and are secured with toggles to keep them from slipping off. The second set of braces is attached just like the first one. Generally, it's a good idea to fasten both bottom corners first. Then it's easier to scissor the braces up and attach them on top. Notice that the braces form X's on either side of the scaffold. This is important for structural reasons. Scaffolds are designed to support weight, just like a bridge or a trestle. So the main structural principle is the same, opposing triangles. This diagram shows an X construction similar to that of the scaffold we just saw. The opposing triangles give the scaffold rigidity since they would individually tend to collapse in opposite directions. Some scaffolds use different arrangements of opposing triangles, but this design and its reverse both handle forces the same way by making them act against each other. You'd use the same kinds of bracing patterns if you were building a scaffold out of wood. This example shows what happens when forces aren't made to oppose each other. The structure has no rigidity and can't handle side forces. Using the correct bracing pattern allows you to stack levels of scaffolding and still maintain a safe, rigid structure. Extensions on top of the first level bucks fit inside the legs of the second level. The second level's braced just like the first, but since the upper bucks are smaller than the lower ones, the braces on the upper level have to be shorter than those below. When the second level's complete, more extensions are inserted into the bucks. These extensions will help keep the scaffold boards from slipping off. Boards are laid flat across the top of the upper level. The boards should extend equally from both sides of the scaffold, so they'll be centered and balanced. Many scaffold boards are made with small blocks of wood on their ends to keep them from sliding off of the top bucks. But since these boards aren't blocked, they have to be wired on for additional safety. The boards are wired together to keep them from spreading and then wired securely to the bucks. It's important to take all the safety precautions you can when working from a scaffold, or you may end up taking the down elevator express. Now, since these guys aren't that anxious to get down in a hurry, they're careful to attach their lifelines to a secure point above their waists to reduce the distance of an accidental fall. If they were working around energized electrical equipment, they'd have to use fiber rope lifelines or electrically ground their metal lines to avoid shock. Now they can go to work, confident that their scaffold is strong and secure. And since they've got their lifelines on, they know that even if something did happen, they'd still be hanging around. Portable scaffolding is something you'll encounter time and time again on the job. There are a lot of different kinds. This one, for example, clips together with no extra fasteners. But whatever kind you use, remember, it's only as strong as you make it. There are really only a few key points to keep in mind. First, make sure opposing bucks are the same size and the braces are the right size for the bucks. Next, be certain that braces are correctly installed and scaffold boards are strong and securely attached. Finally, whenever you're working at a height, Wear a lifeline and safety belt. That much is just plain good sense. In a moment, we'll be back to see some other equipment, powered scaffolds. These are devices that either hydraulically or pneumatically lift you up to the height of the work. But before we go on, look through section five of your text
for some additional information about portable scaffolding. When you have to work overhead, you don't always have to climb. Sometimes you can ride. Powered scaffolds are devices that can raise you up to the level of an overhead job. We're going to talk about two main groups of powered scaffolds, the pneumatic kind and hydraulic lifts. Each of these types has its advantages and disadvantages. We'll be talking about both and we'll see how they're rigged, how they work, and how to use them safely. We'll start with pneumatically powered scaffolds. These pneumatic scaffolds are called spiders. Here, two spiders are being used with a platform called staging between them. Each spider is suspended from overhead on a wire rope. Each control cage has a pneumatic winch on the bottom. The winch raises or lowers the spider in response to the operator's controls. By raising or lowering both spiders together, the staging can be positioned at any level that the cables can reach. The spider's controls are located inside the cage. The main handle controls the operation of the winch. Up, stop, or down. There's also a brake control. Here the brake is off. When it's engaged, it clamps the cable to keep the spider in position. With these two controls, the spider can be raised, lowered, or held in place as long as it's connected to a supply of compressed air. Most pneumatic devices require some kind of lubrication in the airline. Before using a spider, the first thing to check is the level in the airline oiler. The other vessel is a condensation trap. Turning a petcock on the bottom allows you to drain off any moisture that might rust or corrode the pneumatic mechanism. The winch and gearbox both require lubrication. The gearbox oil level has to be checked often and changed at regular intervals, just like the oil in the winch itself. Well, we've seen what the controls look like and looked at a couple of the points you have to check before rigging a spider. Now let's see just how they're rigged. Here's where two spiders are rigged at the top of a boiler. Each cable is secured in a double wrap choker. The strong pipe they're attached to is covered with cloth to insulate the cable electrically from the boiler itself. Otherwise, with any welding going on, there'd be a chance that the wire rope could ground out causing an arc that could weaken or even sever the cable. A safety rope is attached nearby. Both the cable and the safety rope go down through this opening. The cable's insulated again at this point with a rubber hose. The cables are attached to the winches on each spider and the safety ropes pass through special blocks on the worker's safety belts that cinch the rope tightly when tension's put on it. Spider staging is just one kind of pneumatically powered scaffolding, but since it's both common and fairly typical, it's the only pneumatic scaffold we'll cover now. We're going to move on and talk about some hydraulically powered scaffolds. These work something like hydraulic jacks. A pump compresses a hydraulic fluid that drives a ram. The ram lifts a cage from which a man can work. Let's take a look. This model is a fully portable hydraulic lift. It can be pushed to any location and secured in place with locks on each wheel. This is strictly a one-man machine. A ladder on the side makes it easy for the operator to get up and down. A control box on a cable allows him to control the lift from the cage. Since this lift has an electrically powered hydraulic pump, there's no internal combustion engine and no need for fuel. However, you do need to plug it into an electrical outlet. But there is a special provision in case of power failure. There's a handle on the side of the unit 
that allows you to operate the hydraulic pump manually. That way, the lift can always be raised or lowered even if there's no electric power available. There are many similar machines made by other manufacturers. Here's one example. It has a larger capacity and raises somewhat higher than the last one we saw, but it's operated in much the same way. Just as before, the control box is operated by a man in a cage. One big difference between the two kinds we've seen is that this model has to be more thoroughly set up before use. Part of the reason why is its greater reach. When this scaffold's pushed into position, its wheels are jacked up off the floor to hold it in place and to level the rig. Then, collapsible outriggers are spread out and adjusted to the right height. When assembly is complete, the scaffold has a secure platform that's stable and level. Whatever kind of powered scaffold you use, you're going to have to become familiar with your particular type. If you use pneumatic scaffolds like this one, you'll need to know how to rig them properly as well. Since every model is somewhat different, practicing with the units used at your plant is the only way to get to know the techniques and precautions required. That goes for all of the different kinds of equipment we've seen in this unit, including boom cranes, gantry cranes, and overhead traveling cranes. Learning how to operate specialized equipment isn't something that's done overnight. It takes experience and practice. If you're going to be operating these machines at your plant, your instructor will be able to give you detailed instruction and practice exercises to help you develop the experience you need. But even if you're not going to be a crane operator or work from spiders and other powered scaffolds, you've got a basic grasp of what's involved and what kinds of things are crucial to safety. That'll help you whenever you work alongside equipment operators and have to coordinate your efforts with theirs. Throughout this series on rigging, we've stressed that being a good rigger depends on a combination of a lot of different things. Planning a job, inspecting the equipment, and using it effectively and safely. When it comes down to it, it's really up to you. Rigging can mean lifting and moving just about anything. And it's personal experience and knowledge of tools that makes a rigger what he is. When you're practicing with rigging equipment, keep that fact in mind. And remember, rigging isn't a dangerous job unless you make it that way.